All right, welcome. We are continuing our work here in chapter 15 on aqueous solution equilibria. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the concept of the shape of titration curves. Let's get started. All right, you may remember from last year in your introductory chemistry class doing a titration in which you are attempting to find the endpoint of a titration where you had completely neutralized a sample of hydrochloric acid by addition of sodium hydroxide, NaOH. And if you recall from that lab experiment, it was very, very difficult to exactly hit that endpoint right on because when you got close to that endpoint, the system seemed to be very, very sensitive to changes in pH where the addition of a single drop of sodium hydroxide from your burette could have caused a change of several pH units near that endpoint. So we're going to kind of perform a similar experiment in this uh, slide, but instead of trying to slow down and hit that endpoint right on, instead what I want you to imagine is what would happen if we were to simply just add a base at a constant rate to a sample of acid via a titration. And so we're going to look here at the shape of the graph we would generate if we were essentially measuring the volume of base added along the x-axis here and the pH of the solution of the analyte along the y-axis here. Now, a little bit of vocabulary just to refresh your brains here. Um, the analyte is the solution in the beaker down below that we are titrating. The thing that we are doing the titration with, that is the thing that is present in the burette, is the species which we would call the titrant. So in this particular example that we're working with here, we're going to be looking at a strong acid, which will be the analyte down in our beaker down below, an acid like, say, hydrochloric acid. And the titrant here would be a strong base, that is, the species present in the burette, something like, say, sodium hydroxide. Now, notice, as we first start, the initial pH of my solution, if we're measuring down below where the analyte is, is very, very low indicating, again, we have the presence of a strong acid present in our system. And by looking at that initial pH, I see that my pH starting out at a pH of 1 would imply I was starting off with a solution of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. And as we add more and more and more of the titrant, that is, more sodium hydroxide gets added to our system, we're going to see a neutralization reaction take place within the beaker. And we could write an equation describing that neutralization, that is, hydrochloric acid, HCl, would be reacting to sodium hydroxide, NaOH, to form the products of this reaction, which would be water, H2O, and table salt, NaCl. If I wanted to write this as a net ionic equation, recognizing that for all strong acid, strong base titrations, the only species that are really interacting in terms of a chemical change taking place are the hydrogen ions from the acid, H positive, and the hydroxide ions from the base, OH negative. So as a generic net ionic equation for a strong acid, strong base titration, we would see here the combination of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions forming the product water. Now, as we add more and more of the hydroxide ion to our system, we see the pH go up and up and up, and then all of a sudden, as we get to a little bit past 20 milliliters of the base added into our system here, I see that that pH starts to skyrocket. It goes rapidly uh, upwards. And that's going to be approaching what we refer to as either the equivalence point or the end point of that titration. Now, for those of you who are spending some quality time in calculus land right now, you may recognize that this graph shows a portion of the graph before 25 milliliters, which is concave up, and then after that 25 milliliters, the graph switches to concave down, which implies, therefore, we have an inflection point of this graph happening here at a pH of 7. As it turns out, the position where we see that inflection point is the end point of the titration, where the moles of acid that we started with is equivalent to the moles of base we have added into our system at that point. Now, for a strong acid, strong base titration, it makes logical sense that the pH would be 7 at the equivalence point because the species present in the solution at this point now are water and sodium ions and chloride ions. Now, recognizing that the sodium ion is the conjugate acid of sodium hydroxide, a very strong base, and is thus a very, very weak acid, and the chloride ion is the conjugate base of hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, 
the chloride ion therefore being a very, very weak base, I recognize that neither the sodium ion nor the chloride ion have any appreciable acidic or basic properties, implying therefore the pH of this solution should be the pH of a pure water solution, which would therefore be a pH of seven. Now, please be very, very careful on the AP test. When you're asked about the reason why the pH is seven, the reason was why is not because the acid and the base both completely disassociate, because again, disassociation is a property of the acid and the base, which is independent of any reaction. Really what we want to focus on is what is present in the solution at the endpoint. And again, the sodium ions and chloride ions do not impact pH, and therefore we have a neutral solution at our endpoint. If we continue to add base past that endpoint, you see the pH continues to increase, and then it again levels off around a pH of 12 or so, um, and we see the remainder of our graph formed there. Now, one of the big understandings we would like you to have here is why this graph takes the shape that it does. That is, why is it that the initial change in pH seems to be very gradual, but then as we approach that endpoint, the curve gets steeper and steeper and steeper before gradually tapering, tapering off again. To understand why this is the case, let's consider what is present in the solution in high concentrations at various different parts of our titration curve here. Initially, if we look down to the very start of our titration, with a pH of 1 initially, that implies a hydrogen ion concentration of 0.1 molar. Now, if I wanted to change by one pH value, recall that the pH itself is a logarithmic scale, which means to move between the position where the pH is one and the place where the pH is two, that implies that I would essentially have to neutralize uh, from an initial concentration of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid to a concentration at a pH of two of 0.01 molar hydrochloric acid essentially implying to move between those two pH values, I would have to neutralize 0.09 moles per liter of hydrogen ions in my solution, which is a relatively large number of hydrogen ions. Now consider what would happen if I wanted to move between a pH of 6 and a pH of 7. It still represents just one pH unit value, that is one power of 10 difference in the hydrogen ion concentration in our system. But Considering that the pH at a pH of 6 implies a hydrogen ion concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the negative 6 molar, or 0.000001 molar, if I want to go from there to a pH of 7, where my hydrogen ion concentration is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar, I would only have to, at this point, neutralize... 0 0.000009 moles per liter of hydrogen ion. And as you can see, that still represents a power of 10 difference in the hydrogen ion concentration within our solution, so one pH unit, but it now represents a much, much smaller absolute number of hydrogen ions which got neutralized. And that implies, therefore, as we approach that endpoint of the titration, we see a steepening of the curve such that a tiny drop of the base into the system can represent a large change percentage-wise in the number of hydrogen ions which would be present in the system before and after the drop is added. Now, consider the same logic after we have passed the endpoint of that titration when we in, are into the point where there's excess base which has now been added into the solution. Once we find ourselves in a position where the pH of the solution is very high, and therefore we have a high concentration of hydroxide ions in the system, an additional drop of hydroxide ion percentage-wise represents a small incremental increase in the hydroxide concentration in the solution. And as such, just like at the start of the titration, each additional drop does not change the concentration of hydroxide ion by meaningful orders of magnitude, and as such, we see that pH curve start to flatten out again. So taking all that together, we see here the shape of the pH curve makes logical sense where it is most sensitive to changes in pH when the concentrations of both hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion are very, very small in the system. That is, again, around the point of pH of 7, where each of those concentrations is 10 to the negative 7th molar. All right, so now I have an understanding about the shape of that strong acid, strong base titration curve, which we dealt with last year. Let's move on to see what would happen if we introduce a weak species into our system. For the next titration curve we're going to examine here, we're now going to be titrating a weak acid with a strong base.
An example of this particular type of titration would be, for example, if we were titrating acetic acid, which is vinegar, with sodium hydroxide, NaOH. We'll start off by writing an equation describing the reaction between those two species. Recall that the weak acid primarily exists in its molecular form, that is, the generic form HA, and the strong base, really the part of the strong base that I care about, is the hydroxide ion OH negative. Recognizing that the acid is a proton donor and the hydroxide ion is a proton acceptor, the products of that reaction would be water, H2O, and the species A negative, that is the conjugate base of that weak acid. With this generic equation, let's consider again the shape of the titration curve. Initially, when we look at the curve, the first thing I want you to notice is that the initial pH of this solution is significantly higher than where we saw for the strong acid, strong base titration. Again, that should make logical sense because with a weak species, this is going to be not as disassociated in solution as a strong acid would be, and as such, the hydrogen ion concentration should initially be smaller than if we had a strong acid as our starting position. And we see here again an increase in concentration of hydroxide ion as we add the base to the system, resulting in an increase in pH as the titration progresses. And yet again, at a certain point, we start to see that titration curve steepen as we approach the inflection point of this graph. Now, note most importantly here that at the inflection point, that is where we see the end point of this titration, now I have not added any more base into the system, so we again have the same amount of base which has been added, but the pH at the end point of the titration now appears to be, off of this graph, a pH of around 9, significantly above the neutral pH value of 7, in a aqueous environment. Now, let's come to understanding as to why this is in fact the case. I want you to be very, very careful by explaining this not in terms of the initial species which were present, but instead in terms of the species that are present at that endpoint of the titration. A lot of students are tempted to say, well, that weak acid doesn't completely disassociate in solution, and therefore it makes sense that the pH would be basic at the endpoint. But remember, at the endpoint, there really isn't any of that weak acid remaining left in your system. Because we are going to assume that this neutralization reaction that we've written essentially goes to completion due to the presence of that very, very strong base. So consider what actually is present in the solution at this point. We've got a large amount of water which has been formed. The other species present would be the species A negative. And recall that that species A negative is the conjugate base of a weak acid. And recall that if an acid is weaker, that implies its conjugate base must therefore be stronger, which implies the species A negative itself is a relatively stronger conjugate base. And as such, it's going to do what bases do, which is to accept hydrogens. So we can go ahead here and write a hydrolysis reaction, which will be essentially the equilibrium which is dominant at that endpoint of the titration. If we take that species A negative and we react it to water in a hydrolysis reaction, we would see the formation of the products here, which in this case would be HA, and the hydroxide ion OH negative. And again, because we have the presence of that relatively strong conjugate base A negative in solution, it would be logical then to assume that at the end point of the titration, the solution overall should produce an excess of hydroxide ions via the equilibrium as we have written, and as such, the pH at that end point of the titration should be more basic than it had been in the strong acid, strong base titration. Um, Past that point, the same logic is going to hold as we applied during our last conversation in the previous slide, which is upon the addition of the excess strong base, that hydroxide ion concentration will continue to increase, um, and past that point, we would see the excess hydroxide ions causing a very high pH towards the end of the experiment that we are running here. So, we now see a difference here in the weak acid strong base titration, primarily in two points. Number one, a higher initial pH of the analyte solution, and number two, a higher pH at the end point of the titration due to the presence of the conjugate base. Let's take a look now at the in, uh, converse example here, which would be, let's see what happens when we react a strong acid to a weak base. All right, the last interaction we're going to consider here is what's going to happen when we have a strong acid and a weak base interacting together. Now, in this particular titration, as you see we have drawn, we've kind of switched things around a little bit in what we're starting with the solution which is initially basic. And that implies, therefore, we've got a weak base which is present as the analyte of the system down below. 
The titrant, the species present in the burette, would in this case be the acid which we're adding over the course of this reaction. And we can see here a similar idea, that is to say, number one, the initial pH is relatively high due to the presence of the weak base in our initial analyte solution, but not very high because that weak base, again, will not completely ionize in solution. And as the titration occurs, we are adding more and more acid, implying we neutralize some of that base. The pH should, should therefore be decreasing over time. And yet again, we find ourselves in a position where we see a steepening of the curve and again, the inflection point of that graph would represent the position where the endpoint of our titration is occurring. Now, that endpoint appears in this case to be occurring now at a pH of around 5. Let's now justify why, in fact, that would be the case by the same logic we applied on our previous slide. At the endpoint of the titration, if we look at a generic equation for the reaction that's been occurring here, um, hydrogen ions from that strong acid, H positive, would be reacting to some generic base in the system, which we'll just call B. And again, the base is a proton acceptor, which means the product of that reaction would be the species BH1 positive. That species BH1 positive is the conjugate acid of a weak base. And as such, that is a relatively strong conjugate acid. So we can consider then the behavior of that species at the endpoint as it undergoes a hydrolysis reaction with water. The species BH positive would react to water as a proton donor, forming hydronium ions, H3O positive, and the base B in the system. And once this equilibrium establishes itself at that endpoint of the titration, again, you can see we would produce an excess of hydronium ions present in the system, and as such, at the endpoint of the titration, the pH should be slightly acidic in comparison to a strong acid, strong base titration. So, long story short, very similar situation to the previous slide here. That is, we see a weak base initially titrated will result in the formation of the conjugate acid of that weak base at the endpoint. And as such, the solution would be acidic at the endpoint of our titration. All right. So we've now seen what the expected shapes of these titration curves are. Now let's take a look on our next slide about how to generate the form of a titration curve from calculations rather than by running an experiment. All right, now in our final slide for this lecture here, we're going to talk about how you can make a calculation of the pH of a solution during a titration at any given point throughout that titration curve. Now, most importantly, what I want you to understand here is the approach that we will use to solve for the pH of a solution is going to differ depending upon where along that titration curve we are because the species present in the solution will be differing depending upon where we are within that titration curve. So we're going to kind of break up our titration curve into a variety of different regions here. We're going to highlight several different important points and talk about what approach we might use to find the pH at any given point along that curve. So we'll go ahead here and take a look here at a titration of a weak acid by a strong base. So again, this would be like an example of acetic acid vinegar being titrated by sodium hydroxide NaOH. And we're going to break this up into several different points. We'll start off here with the point labeled on this titration curve as point A. Point A is the position along this titration curve at which we have not added any of the strong base into our system, and as such, the major species present in our solution is that weak acid, HA. So at this point, what we really have is how to find the pH of a weak acid. And this is now a familiar calculation to make. To find the pH of a weak acid, all we really need to know is the Ka of that weak acid, which will allow me to find the pH of the solution using the familiar approach of an ice table at this position. So at point A, let's label this here. This is the initial concentration of that weak acid, HA. And the approach to finding the pH is we're going to be using that ice table. Now go ahead and consider another point along this curve here. Let's kind of break them up into pieces. Let's look at point D. Point D, as labeled on this curve, is the end point of the titration, or the equivalence point would be the other, the other term for this. Recall at the equivalence point of our titration, if we look at the reaction which is occurring between these species, the weak acid HA is going to be reacting to the strong base OH negative. And as such, we can write a neutralization reaction here, which shows HA plus OH negative forming the products, which are H2O, water, 
and the conjugate base A negative. And as we just described on a previous slide, the species that I'm interested in now at that endpoint is the major species in solution, which is the conjugate base A negative. Recalling a conjugate base A negative is going to do what bases do, which is to accept protons. I'm going to approach finding the pH of this solution by writing a hydrolysis reaction, that is, what happens when A negative reacts to water, H2O, forming HA and OH negative. And as we've seen in previous conversations, to find the pH of a solution where I have a base A negative in solution, I again can solve this using equilibrium tools, that is, I can set up an ice table, but this time using the conjugate bases hydrolysis reaction as the organizing tool for my ice table. Now, importantly here, folks, recognize that if I'm solving an ice table with that conjugate base, the K value that will govern that ice table is not the Ka of the acid we started with, but instead the Kb of that conjugate base. And recall we can find the Ka of a conjugate base by recognizing that the product of Ka times Kb for any acid and conjugate base pairing is always equal to the value of Kw, that is, the autoionization constant of water. So point D we'll recognize here again at that equivalence point. We're going to be using an ice table with the conjugate base to solve for the pH of my solution. So we've taken care of the initial concentration of the acid at point A and the endpoint of the titration at point D. Let's now talk about what's going on within the region marked as B here within our titration curve. Point B represents all the points after which we have started adding sodium hydroxide to our solution, that strong base, but before the endpoint of the titration. And again, if we look back to the neutralization reaction which is occurring, in which the acid HA reacts to the base OH negative, forming water H2O and the conjugate base A negative, at any point within this region here we've marked B, there would both be the presence of the excess unreacted acid HA in our solution, but also there would be a certain amount of the conjugate base A negative as a result of the neutralization reaction which has been occurring throughout this range. So thinking about that, that really means that here I've got the presence of both a weak acid, HA, and the conjugate base of that weak acid, which is A negative, which implies throughout this entire region, I have the components of a buffer system. So we're going to label this as what we call the buffer region of our graph. And as the solution in our analyte here would at this point be a buffer, we have an easy tool which we've developed in order to calculate pHs of buffer solutions, which is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So we can apply throughout this region here of the buffer region, the equation which is the pH of my solution is equal to the pKa of the acid plus the log of the ratio of the concentration of the conjugate base A negative divided by the acid's concentration HA. So we're going to be using the Henschel and Hasselbalch equation. Now that being said, please be very, very careful with this approach because this is going to require really two steps. Initially, we're going to have to find the relative concentrations of the acid HA and its conjugate base A negative through here by essentially using stoichiometry. That is, we could set up an ICN table to determine how much of the weak acid remains untitrated and how much of the base A negative has been formed via the neutralization reaction. Once we have found the moles of acid present in the system that are left over, plus the moles of the conjugate base A negative that have been produced, we can then divide by the total volume of the solution at any given point to find the respective molarities of our weak acid and its conjugate base. And once I have those molarities, at that point, I'm free to plug in to our henderson hasselbalch equation. All right, so that takes care of three of the positions within our uh, curve right now. We have two more remaining that we need to discuss. An additional point we want to look at here is a very special point within that buffer region, which I have labeled here as point C. Now notice here on our titration curve, the end point of the titration is occurring when a volume of 25 milliliters of our strong base has been added into our system. Point C appears to be around where 12 and a half milliliters or so of the base have been added. That is, at this position, we are exactly halfway to the end point of our titration. Now, this is a very important point we call the halfway point of the titration. And let's again look to what's going on within our system in terms of the relative amounts of the acid and the conjugate base which must be present. If I start off with an initial amount of the acid, HA, and I react to it, OH negative, at that halfway point, by definition, I will have added 
half the number of moles of the acid that I started with as base into that system. So, for example, if I had started with 0.1 mole of the acid HA, at the halfway point, I would have added 0.05 moles of the base OH negative. And again, because we're essentially going to assume that this neutralization reaction more or less goes to completion due to the presence of that strong base, if I look at the products of that neutralization reaction in an ICN table, you'll see here that what that really means is I will have produced 0.05 moles of the conjugate base A negative via that neutralization reaction. Implying, therefore, at the halfway point of the reaction, the concentration of the molecular acid HA should be equal to the concentration of the conjugate base A negative. And as those concentrations at this point are equal to one another, if I apply my henderson hasbach equation, you'll notice that we are currently in a special place. Again, henderson hasbach tells me the pH of the solution is equal to the pKa of the acid plus the log of the ratio of the conjugate base A negative's concentration divided by the concentration of HA. And again, at that halfway point, we just determined that A negative and HA are equal in concentration at this location, implying the henderson hasselbach equation now tells me the pH of the solution is equal to the pKa plus the log of a ratio which must be, in this case, 1. And because that ratio of A negative to HA at this point is 1, that implies the log of 1 is always 0. And therefore, at that position where the halfway point of our titration has been reached, the pH of the solution must be equivalent to the pKa of the acid. So this is a really, really easy place to find the pH. All you have to do is to take the negative log of the Ka of your weak acid, and you know, therefore, what the pH of your solution would be at that halfway point. All right. So we've identified now four of the five different regions along our pH curve. There's only one that remains, and that is point E. Notice here at point E along that curve, we are now in a position where we are well past the end point of our titration. And because of that, if we look again to our neutralization reaction, we will have consumed essentially all of the initial acid which we started with in our solution. And at this point, we're just adding an excess amount of hydroxide ion into the system. So at this point, what we're going to be using is essentially stoichiometry. Looking again at that neutralization, HA plus OH negative reacts to form H2O, and A negative. And if I start off with some initial amount of the acid, let's call it for just an example sake here, 0.1 mole, past that endpoint, I'll have added significantly more base to the system. So the value of the number of moles of OH negative that we've added will be greater than the moles of HA we started with. So we will have essentially at this point consumed all of the HA present, and in doing so produced essentially a large amount of the conjugate base A negative, but there will also be present in the solution a large amount of excess hydroxide ion that are essentially just going straight into the solution without reacting to anything. And recall that hydroxide ion is the strongest base that can exist within the aqueous solution, which implies at this point past the end point, we essentially have a mixture of the very strong base OH negative and a relatively weaker base A negative. So what we really need to know at this point is what is the concentration of that excess hydroxide ion we've added? Because when you've got a mixture of species, the stronger species tends to be the species which is the primary producer of hydroxides in solution, and therefore the only one we meaningfully care about in terms of a pH or pOH calculation. So to find the pOH or pH at point E, the approach we would take would be to solve initially an ICN table to determine the number of moles of excess hydroxide ion that we've added into our system. Once we have that number of moles of excess hydroxide, we could then divide by the total volume of the solution, assuming the volumes of acid we started with and the base we've added are additive in this system, to find the molarity of excess hydroxide in the solution at any given point. And then I could simply take the negative log of that value to find the pOH, and then subtract that from 14 to find the pH of our system. So at that point, we're essentially using stoichiometry to find the excess amount of hydroxide ions which are present. So long story short, about that, we can now go ahead and essentially generate the entirety of the shape of a pH curve mathematically if I simply know the concentration of the initial acid we started with and its Ka value, as well as the relative amounts of hydroxide ion I've added at any given different point. And we have five different approaches for how to solve for that pH depending upon where we are within our solution.
and you'll definitely get some practice utilizing these both in our titration lab we're doing during the course of this unit, as well as in your assigned homework problems. So that is essentially the approaches we're going to be take. Um, other than that, I think we're in good shape for understanding the shape of a titration curve. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you at the next lecture.